Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The Pentagon has released an assessment saying that the Islamic State has lost control over a quarter of the territory it once controlled just a year ago in Iraq. The announcement comes about two weeks after Iraq declared a major victory against the Islamic State in retaking the city of Tikrit. In the meantime, Prime Minister of Iraq, Haider al-Abadi, is here in Washington, D.C. He is already met with President Obama and secured $200 million. And he is on his way to IMF and the World Bank seeking assistance to address the huge deficit he's facing uh, back at home due to the war against the IS plus the falling oil prices. Now joining us to discuss the latest developments is Patrick Coben. Patrick is the Middle East correspondent for The Independent and author of the newly released book, The Rise of the Islamic State, ISIS, and the New Sunni Revolution. Thank you so much for joining us, Patrick. Thank you. So Patrick, what is this all about, the Pentagon declaring that they have reclaimed land that ISIS had controlled just a year ago? It's a bit optimistic. Um, first of all, it refers only to Iraq. I think it says elsewhere that the Islamic State is expanding in Syria, and they've just taken a part of Damascus. Uh, so, um, but even in Iraq, again, it's a little misleading. Uh, the Islamic State has been driven out of various areas around Baghdad, which are quite important. But to and to Crete and elsewhere, it hasn't really fought back. I mean, this is at least in part a guerrilla organization in terms of military tactics. It's not like a regular army that holds front lines. Uh, therefore, exactly how much territory it holds is a bit irrelevant. Uh, also, if you look at that map and you don't know Iraq, it's not quite clear that most people in Iraq uh, live in cities and towns along the great big rivers of Tigris and Euphrates. And in between, there's desert and semi-desert, which isn't that uh, uh, heavily populated. So I think the purpose of this is to give a sense that present policy of uh, uh, bombing uh, selectively is working in weakening uh, and uh, ultimately eliminating Islamic State. And I think that that's just straight untrue, unfortunately. Now, the U.S. military reported that uh, last week they had conducted 15 airstrikes in Iraq compared with the two in Syria. Now, what does this tell us about what's going on in the region in the fight back against the IS? It does point to something pretty significant, which is in Iraq, they've been bombing in support of the Iraqi Kurds in the north, uh, of the Iraqi army in the west. Uh, they say they're not bombing in support of the Shia militias, but in practice they're bombing the same places that are under attack by Shia militias. Uh, now, in Syria, the situation is different. Um, because the biggest military power in Syria is the Syrian army under the Syrian government uh, run by President Bashar al-Assad. And they rather deliberately have not been bombing uh, Islamic State, where it's in confrontation with the Syrian army, because there's this rather contradictory policy of opposing Islamic State, but also opposing Assad. So they're only really bombing, or mainly they're bombing, in support of the Syrian Kurds, right up in the uh, northeast of the country, and in order to destroy some of the oil facilities that the Islamic State has captured. Patrick, in your last article in The Independent on Sunday, you wrote, in the Middle East, our enemy's enemy must be our friend. Al-Qaeda-type movements are gaining ground, and there's only one way to stop them. Um, so how should they be stopped? Well, uh, you know, there's this extraordinary uh, policy of the U.S. and its European allies and uh, uh, its other allies in the region, uh, which was summed up by this, what, uh, to my mind, is a very silly slogan, 
uh, saying the enemy of our enemy is not our friend, but in which means that the the fact that uh, let's say the Syrian government uh, uh, in Damascus is opposed to Islamic State, or the Houthis down in uh, Yemen are opposed to Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, doesn't make them our friend. But you know, try to think of that in practical terms. When Islamic State is advancing west and is fighting the Syrian army, do we deliberately not bomb uh, Islamic State because uh, they're fighting the Syrian army, which is much in the interests of Islamic State? It gives them a good chance of winning. Uh, similarly, down in Yemen, if we're trying to put pressure on the Houthis, uh, this uh, uh, movement that the Saudis have been attacking and uh, describing as Iranian run. I don't think it is, but uh, um, that's the way they've been presenting it. But that is one of the main enemies of Al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. So again, if we don't, if we uh, don't support them and uh, uh, regard them as just as bad as Al Qaeda, then that is good for Al Qaeda. You know, it's a pretty simple point, but I think it's one that governments have been avoiding. Uh, 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 taking on board. Patrick, some critics say that there are other ways to defeat the IS besides these airstrikes and actual military confrontation, uh, mainly by social development programs creating a real democratic alternative uh, society. What do you make of that? Well, you know, then they'd have to spell out how you do it, you know. I think Islamic State, you know, is pretty bad. You know, in some ways, it's the equivalent of the Nazis in Europe. I don't mean that the enemies of uh, the Nazis in Europe were all good, but the Nazis were pretty bad. And Islamic State <clears throat> has conducted massacres of um, uh, communities like the Yazidis, whom it regards as pagans. It's uh, massacred the villagers. It's taken the women and... Uh, raped them and sold them as slaves. Uh, it's distributed them among, among its own fighters. Uh, it's massacred, it's conducted massacres of uh, 1,700 Iraqi army young cadets of uh, tribes who uh, oppose them. So exactly what do we do about this? Um, so, you know, the Islamic State has many enemies, but they spend so much time hating each other and confronting each other that they've let the Islamic State off the hook. Now, Patrick, those same critics that oppose military attacks argued that that uh, money that one would spend on uh, military uh, would be better spent uh, in social and community programs, rebuilding the region, particularly Iraq and, and Syria. Uh, what do you say to them? It just isn't realistic. Uh, you know, these are very immediate threats. These may be good things to do in the long term. They might have some effect, though I don't know exactly how you do it. <coughs> in present sense, should I start that again? Yes. Uh, I just don't think that that's realistic. Uh, these are long-term reforms, difficult to implement in countries uh, like Iraq and Syria. But the threat is much more immediate. I mean, what do you do at the moment if Islamic State uh, vehicles are coming down the road and they're going to massacre villages uh, if they take them over, particularly if they think they're of a different uh, a Muslim sect or they disapprove of them for other reasons? Uh, these long-term social economic reforms are really not very relevant to stopping them. Patrick, the role of the UN in all of this uh, obviously is to keep peace. That is its mission. Um, how are they doing in terms of addressing the regional conflict, and is it useful? Well, I, th you know, the United Nations have just come together to uh, condemn the uh, Houthis, uh, who are these uh, uh, one faction in Yemeni politics that have taken over most of the country and to uh, support essentially the blockade of Yemen. Yemen imports most of its food. That's kind of a vote to starve the Yemeni people as a whole. Uh, Saudi bombing isn't going to uh, evict these people from power. Uh, and 
you know, when the Israelis were bombing Gaza last year, you know, there were many international protest protests, quite rightly, but there are very few protests over what's happening in Yemen. So it, it may end up by killing a lot more people. Patrick, the prime minister of Iraq is here and uh, he's actually raising money. And part of the argument he is using is that he has a huge humanitarian crisis, which he does, according to the UN, to manage. And he needs a lot more money for these programs. You were just in uh, Iraq just three weeks ago. What are the conditions on the ground? And uh, what kind of assistance is actually required to address them? Well, it is gigantic. You know, millions of people have been forced to flee uh, Islamic State or they've had to be forced to flee the fighting elsewhere. Uh, you know, you're in, when I was, I was in northern Iraq a few weeks ago, and from a distance you see half-built modern buildings like you might see in the U.S. or European city, and then you get close to them, and you see there are people living in these half-built malls and uh, hotels and apartment buildings. And these are the refugees living in tents, you know, set up in this uh, raw concrete. Uh, we're, going to, we're getting towards summer now. It's incredibly hot there. Uh, there's a shortage of drinking water. There's a shortage of everything. Um, so this combines with the price of oil being down. So the Iraqi government doesn't have anything like the resources uh, it had, or thought it had, a year ago. The money isn't there. Now, they hope to get some money from the U.S. and uh, from the World Bank and the IMF. Um, I think they might get a little, but I don't think it's going to be that great uh, because uh, uh, these organizations really aren't in a position to uh, give large loans or uh, to um, the Iraqi government of the kind they need. So uh, the, these refugees are all in a, in a desperate situation. Patrick, the, the falling oil prices, what impact is it really having on the Iraqi government's ability to address the humanitarian crisis it's facing? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're very short of money. Uh, you know, this has always been true since 2003. I remember a friend of mine who had been a minister in the Iraqi government saying he'd never seen other ministers panic except when the price of oil went down. Now, the price of oil is right down. That's the only sort of revenue there. The only other thing that Iraq exports is a few dates, you know, from the date palms. So they're very broke. Secondly, this is one of the most corrupt governments on the planet. So that all the money they've been spending over the years, the hundreds of billions of dollars, trillions of dollars, on the army, on uh, uh, facility, I mean, you know, to produce water, to everything else, just aren't there. So it's a pretty weak structure to begin with. And it was sort of kept going by this constant uh, 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 flood of uh, oil money. About 100, used to be about $100 billion a year. And everything was geared to that. And suddenly, the taps haven't been turned off, but they're not producing anything like what they did before. Um, uh, the last time we reported on the um, on the budget of the Iraqi government, uh, it was actually 50% uh, below uh, what they had anticipated in terms of having revenue. Uh, primarily because of the loss of um, the, in, sorry, primarily because of the uh, fall in the oil prices. Now, this uh, plea for assistance by the IMF and the World Bank and the $200 million that uh, President Obama had actually um, signaled that he would, he would allocate for Iraq uh, doesn't come close to addressing the budgetary problems it's facing. So what will it do? Well, it will, you know, people will go hungry or people will be drinking bad water. You know, they're already doing that inside Islamic State. You know, the uh, uh, places like Mosul, the water is very dirty, but people don't have much alternative. So a consequence is the local hospitals are full of people with hepatitis and uh, other illnesses, uh, um, which comes from uh, drinking uh, polluted water. Um, so things are simply going to get worse. Um, 
it's also just the size of the problem. You know, in Syria and Iraq, just millions of refugees have moved even from Syria into Turkey, into uh, Lebanon, into Jordan. In Iraq, they've sort of, there have been whole sort of uh, movements suddenly over, you know, a couple of months, half a million people will move, then the next couple of months, the same figure. Uh, it could be very difficult even for a well-organized country to sustain these mass movements of people. And this is a country which is already very fragile, which has been shattered by war over the last 30 years. And, uh, and if, uh, as you say, corruption is such a problem, uh, what are the chances that the IMF or the World Bank will be giving any uh, financial assistance to, to it on one hand? And then a second, is this not a, a way of dragging Iraq into the international financial uh, machine uh, that then puts it in a, a situation that it, you know, is unable to pay back these loans. Yeah, I don't know about that. I think that probably the Iraqi government isn't really up capable of producing sort of def definite projects that they need financed. They're, uh, they, they're just sort of producing general demands for money. Uh, but even if they did get it, and I don't think they'll get enough, uh, I, it wouldn't be uh, sufficient to deal with the scale of the problems that they're facing. Okay. So, Patrick, thank you so much for joining us today on the Real News Network. No, thank you. And we always appreciate your insights. And uh, thank you for joining us on the Real News Network.